Good evening, everyone. I'm Andres Velindovsky, Head of School of Physics and Mathematics uh, at the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom. Welcome to our 17th Astro Chart with our uh, visiting professor, uh, Donald Kurtz, who physically is in South Africa. So we have quite a different uh, weather condition. I'm in rainy Lincoln in uh, uh, Christmas jumper because it is National uh, Christmas jumper day in United Kingdom. And Don is probably in quite warm temperature in South Africa. Is it so, Don? Uh, it was 29 degrees here today, Andre, <laughs> with a nice uh, blue sky. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome here, and uh, welcome everyone who <clears throat> join us. I see this is very, very uh, broad uh, uh, audience. We have people from nearby, uh, from Newark, from Lancashire, Ian Campbell, I see. Uh, I see Jen Elizabeth Madison from Austin, Texas. Welcome. Uh, and I see many, many more people. Welcome, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> tonight, uh, 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 our program is as usual. Um, Dawn will have a, um, a short presentation followed by <clears throat> a Q&A session. Uh, you can ask your question in a live chat. So please uh, use live chat. Uh, 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 in uh, um, in the, uh, below this uh, video, and then we try to answer uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, oh yeah, hello, John. Uh, some people ask why I'm not in my uh, traditional tie. Yeah, it's just just an excuse because it is our last astro chart before Christmas. I thought my Christmas jumper will do for for today. Uh, uh, um, as it is already our traditional chart, uh, Dawn is not really requiring uh, extensive uh, introduction. Uh, if you would like to read about Dawn's bio again, you just uh, click on the link in description to this video, and then you, you can read about uh, Dawn and his career. Uh, I just mentioned one thing. Dawn gave public lectures in all continents by but one. I think one is still on a uh, to-do list done, right? And okay. therefore we extremely fortunate that uh, thanks to technology, we can chat with Dawn about fascinating astrophysics uh, uh, topics. Uh, floor to you, Dawn. Thank you, Andre, and good evening, everyone, or good day or good night, wherever you are in the world. It's nice to be back. I've missed our Astro Chats this last couple of months. Combination of things, summer and duties of various people kept us from coming back to you. Hopefully we'll have them back on schedule for roughly once a month after this one. So let me bring up our slideshow. Ah, interesting. Okay, I can see it too, good. So the question for tonight is, how do we know how much stuff is out there? And we astronomers quite happily will tell you what the mass of the Earth is, what the mass of the moon is, uh, the sun, asteroids, planets, but then stars, galaxies, even the entire universe. How do we know that? That's our subject for tonight. Now, just a year ago, a mission called the Artemis mission went for 25 days out beyond the moon and back again with the Orion capsule, which you can see in this picture. Now, a year from now, it's planned that it will go again, Artemis II, and then it will be carrying four astronauts, four men and one woman. And then uh, roughly a year after that, if things go to schedule, the next set of astronauts will actually land on the moon again. In this picture, you can see a little crater here called Marius. It's 40 kilometers across. But then the crater I'd like you to look at is right up here at the top, just a bit cut off. And you can see that when the asteroid smacked into the moon, it splashed material all across the surface of the moon. You can see the rays of the debris coming out. That crater, we astronomers have named after one of the most famous astronomers of all time. That is crater Kepler. It's named after Johannes Kepler, 
who lived, as you can see, 1571 to 1630. Kepler was a mathematician, he was a physicist, and in his life he became the assistant to the great Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, and when Brahe died, Kepler inherited his observations, particularly his observations of the planet Mars. And then over a period of nearly 20 years, Kepler tried to figure out what were the rules by which the planets move about the sun. In his first book, he published his first two laws. The book was about the motion of Mars. And then as you'll see, it took him another 10 years till 1619. Uh, let me bring up a laser pointer here. Let's get a laser pointer. There we go. To get his third law, and it is his third law that dominates the answers to our question tonight. How do we know masses of things in the universe? So Kepler's laws, his first law was that each planet moves about the sun on an orbit, which is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Now, this is a graphic showing you roughly the shape of an ellipse. An ellipse has two focuses. In the case of the orbits of the planet, the sun's at one focus. Nothing is at the other. But for our purposes tonight, the important thing is, is that this long axis is called the major axis. And half that long axis is called the semi-major axis. And that's the thing that we use to characterize the size of an orbit of one object about another. Semi-major axis is half the long axis of two, two objects orbiting each other in an ellipse, as Kepler discovered for the planet Mars. His second law, he found that the planet moves faster when it's near the sun and slows down when it's farther away. And the law says that if you draw a line between the planet and the sun, between two positions, let's say this is motion over one week, then when the planet's closer to the sun and moving faster, the line to the sun's shorter, but the planet moves farther. And this area in a given time is always the same. We now know, and we can even show our first year undergraduates how to derive that this is just a form of the law of conservation of angular momentum, that is conservation of spin. The important thing is that the planet speeds up when it gets close to the sun and then it slows down when it goes farther away. And then Kepler's all important third law, which took him another decade to discover, is so simple when we look at it. It says the period of the planet orbiting the sun, in the case of the earth, that's one year, times itself. Mathematically, we would write that as p squared. Don't worry about the equations, I will show you. I'll tell you what they mean for those of you who um, aren't too excited about looking at those. So the period times itself is equal to that semi-major axis, half the long axis of the orbit, times itself twice. We call that A cubed. Extremely simple law. You can see it works for the Earth because the period of the Earth is one year, one times one is one, and the distance of the Earth from the sun is by definition the astronomical unit, one times one times one is one. Remarkably, this works for all the other planets, too, and for any two things orbiting about each other. The reason for showing you this musical notation at the bottom is that Kepler was enamored with the idea of the music of the spheres from Pythagoras from 2,000 years earlier than him, and he thought that the planets needed to have some sort of harmony to the motion about the sun, and it was that belief that held him back and took nearly 10 years before he gave up this idea of a harmony and went back to figure out from first principles how the planets moved and discovered his third law. So that Kepler's form of his third law, it's not quite far enough for our purposes tonight. And I assure you, I'm not going to give you equations all night, but there'll be a few of them up here. And this important one comes from Isaac Newton. A generation after Kepler, Newton, during the plague, when he was away from Cambridge, back out near his home, um, he invented his law of gravity. He invented his three laws of motion. The first one, which says an object in motion will continue in motion unless a force acts on it. That's the law of inertia. His second one says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And his third one, you've heard many times, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So he invented the law of gravity. He invented his three laws of motion. He invented calculus, and he put all those things together, and he calculated how a planet should move around the sun if gravity was keeping the planet in its orbit. And 
from pure thought, writing that down, he discovered his form of Kepler's third law. Here it is. It looks more complicated, but it's not very much. These numbers right here, that pi is just the ratio of the diameter to the circumference of a circle. This G is just a constant. It gives the scale of the interaction. It's called the gravitational constant. And so there's Kepler's law. The period times itself is equal to the semi-major axis times itself times itself again. But look what's new. Newton discovered it also depended on the masses of the two objects orbiting each other. It depended on the sum of the masses. So in this little diagram I drew down here at the right, it shows you how objects actually orbit each other. In the case of a planet orbiting the sun, it's not just that the planet orbits the sun, but the sun orbits the planet too. They orbit about a point called the barycenter, which is the balance point between their gravities. This is exactly the same as the balance point on a playground seesaw, where if you move the fulcrum off center, then you could have a heavy person on one end with a short fulcrum and a lighter person on the other end, and they would balance. So the definition of where this barycenter is, is that the ratio of the distances from that for the two objects is inversely equal to the ratio of masses. And then from Newton's form of Kepler's third law, we can measure how long it takes a planet to go around the sun. We learned in the 18th century how to measure how far away the sun is from, from the Earth and then from the other planets. And so we get the sum of the two objects, the masses and the ratio, and from that we can determine their masses. And this is actually how we determine most of the masses in the universe, including going up right onto the largest scale we're going to look at in a little while. There's some other methods, but this is the important one. To give you an idea about these objects orbiting their very center, if we imagine this is the sun, mass one, and over to the right there is mass two, let that be Jupiter, which I hope you're seeing every night. It's beautifully up all night right now, brightest thing in the night sky after it gets dark when the moon's not around. The balance point between Jupiter and the sun, because Jupiter has one one thousandth the mass of the sun, the sun is one one thousandth the distance from that point that Jupiter is. That's actually outside the surface of the sun. The sun wobbles about that point every 12 years as Jupiter goes around that same point or apparently orbiting the sun from our point of view. So there's a nice little diagram of the Earth's actual orbit. It's exaggerated. Of course, the Earth and the sun aren't to scale in terms of their sizes. And you'll see here in December, the Earth's rushing along, and in early January, we actually hit the closest point to the sun in our orbit. That's called the perihelion. And then six months later, we hit the farthest point from the sun. And there's that long semi-major axis with the sun at one focus. The measurement of the size of the Earth's orbit, the semi-major axis, our distance from the sun, that was difficult. And as I said, it took until the 18th century to do that. That's another story for another time. The time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun, humans have known since antiquity. That number's been known certainly for 5,000 years to very high position. And so we put those together with Newton's form of Kepler's third law. The semi-major axis, half the long axis for the Earth's orbit, look the precision that we know it to. We know it to an incredible precision. And then, of course, I haven't given you all the decimal points, but we also know the period of the Earth around the sun. Putting it into Newton's form of Kepler's third law, we get the mass of the sun plus the mass of the Earth. And the Earth is so tiny compared to the sun that for our first look at this, we can just neglect the Earth's mass. It's only one three hundred and thirty thousandth that of the sun. And so we've just measured the mass of the sun simply by measuring the time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun and how far away the Earth is from the sun. And that number is one solar mass is about two followed by 30 zeros in kilograms. 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. The Earth is only 1 330,000th of that. And so we now know that the Sun is vastly bigger than the Earth. Here's a nice time-lapse movie showing the rotation of the Sun. At the equator, it takes about 26 days to rotate. And these sunspots that you see moving across the face of the Sun here, each one of them, those are about the size of the Earth. This big sunspot group coming around over on the side, over here on the left, much, much bigger than the Earth. So the sun's 330,000 times more massive than the Earth. It's more than 100 times farther across. And we've learned that from Newton's form of Kepler's third law. 
and finding the distance to the sun. But how do we do this for other stars? How do we know how massive the stars are? We can use the orbit of the planets around the sun to get the masses of the planets. We can use the orbits of the moons around the planets to get the masses of the planets and the moons. But what about the other stars? We get their masses from what are called eclipsing binary stars. Now, actually the majority of stars in the sky are orbiting other stars. It's incredibly common. And in this little graphic, you will see two stars orbiting about each other. One passes in front of the other, and the bottom is showing you that the brightness dips as one blocks light from the other. Trying to get this little movie to stop, and I can't find the button. Okay, we'll let it go. It'll stop by itself. So it's these eclipsing binaries that allow us to map out how long it takes the, plant, the stars to orbit each other and how far apart they are. The data that we use for that, I'll let that go again, is measuring the velocities of the stars. We can do that by spectroscopy. We look at the spectrum of the star, the light coming to us. We recognize the pattern of the wavelengths of various elements. And when the stars come towards us, those wavelengths get shifted to shorter wavelength. When they go away, they get shifted to longer wavelength, we can measure the velocity. And if you know how fast the star is going and you know how long they take to go around, then you know how far they had to go. That gives you the distance. And of course, the period you can just see by watching the eclipses. So we put that together for all these eclipsing binary stars. And then we make a chart, which is, this graph is one of the most important graphs in all of astronomy. When two astronomers sit down to talk about stars, Almost always, the first thing they do is they draw one of these diagrams named after Einar Hertzsprung, Henry Norris Russell, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It plots the temperature of the stars along the bottom axis, and it plots how bright they are along the vertical axis. And we discover that the stars lie in what's called a main sequence for most stars, and that's a mass sequence. From these eclipsing binaries, we discovered that the hottest, brightest stars, and these stars can be a million times brighter than the sun, temperatures of 30, 50,000 degrees. Those have got up to 100 or even slightly more times the mass of the sun. Whereas most stars in the galaxy, most stars in the universe are actually these little tiny red stars down at the right-hand side of the diagram. And we call just lost my talk. There we go. We call those red dwarfs, and they have a mass only about a tenth the mass of the sun. Because these are so faint, you see down here they're 100 to 1,000 times fainter than the sun. They lead very long lives. They can live a 1,000 times longer than the sun, which is here. Whereas these very massive stars, because they're so bright, they fuse their hydrogen to helium, which is what powers them while they're on this main sequence. And they can have lifetimes as short as a million years for the most massive ones. When they get old, they evolve to be giants or red giants. And here are some star names you might recognize. Betelgeuse, the bright red star in the constellation of Orion, which is a, a rising for you oh, in an hour or two where you are in Lincoln. Um, for me here in South Africa, already they're, they're already coming up in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Antares, which is a bright red giant, not as big as Betelgeuse, but bright red giant uh, in the constellation Scorpius, the rival of Mars, that's setting over near the sun now. Aldebaran, the bright red giant in um, Taurus the Bull, near the Pleiades cluster. These stars are in the old stages of stars, late in their lives. Stars live most of their lives on the main sequence, fusing hydrogen to helium, then they start fusing helium to carbon, they become red giants, and then they die. And so here's a schematic showing you roughly stars' lives. They're born out of gas clouds in the galaxy, as you can see on the left. The gas cloud collapses under gravity and forms a whole cluster of stars, most of them average stars. This yellow one here is supposed to be like the sun. It lives its life fusing hydrogen to helium, and as it starts to build up a helium core, it starts getting brighter, but it cools and becomes a red giant. 
And then late in its life, it blows away its outer atmosphere as a planetary nebula, and it leaves behind a little tiny white dwarf, which is the core of the red giant. That white dwarf is primarily made out of carbon and oxygen. That's what helium is fused into. It's roughly the size of the Earth, but with, in some cases, the mass of the sun. 97% of all stars die as white dwarfs. The other 3%, the massive stars, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun, when they become red supergiants, their cores build up until they're made out of iron. And iron then collapses catastrophically, blows the star to bits as a supernova, and the collapsed core is left behind either as a neutron star or as a black hole. And I will tell you how we know the masses of these things, how we've learned that uh, in just a moment. Now, in 1930, a young Indian man, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, sailed from then Madras, now Chennai in India, to Cambridge to study astrophysics. He was a child prodigy. Uh, he was a prodigy his entire life. And when he got to Cambridge, 1930, on his three-week voyage there, he had used the new general relativity, only invented by Einstein some 15 years earlier, and calculated what the maximum mass of the core of a dying star could have. We call it the Chandrasekhar mass. It's 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Now, these white dwarfs at that time were extremely mysterious. The professor at Cambridge, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, didn't believe Chandrasekhar at all. They had a reasonably good relationship when they were at the university, but in public there was considerable conflict, and Chandrasekhar was only a student. He was young. He was Indian. It was time of empire. Eddington was the powerful professor and astronomers didn't actually end up believing that Chandrasekhar was right about the white dwarfs until about 1960, um, another 25 years later. The physicists believed him, but not the astronomers. He was right. He got the Nobel Prize, as you can see, I've noted down here, 1983, for his work determining the maximum size a white dwarf can have, the Chandrasekhar mass. Now, on the left here is a picture of the bright star Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky. The spikes are just artifacts from the arms that hold up one of the mirrors in the telescope. But look carefully down here where I put the arrow, and you can see a little tiny dot, which is, in fact, another star orbiting about what we call Sirius A. This is Sirius B, and it's a white dwarf. It was known to be a white dwarf at the time Chandrasekhar came to Cambridge, and it was a tremendous puzzle. It has the same temperature as Sirius A, 10,000 degrees. How could a star be so tiny and yet at that temperature um, be rivaling in temperature the brightness per area of Sirius A? It just, it wasn't understood how such a thing could exist. Chandrasekhar solved the problem, but Eddington just found it implausible. And as I said, the astronomers, because Eddington was so authoritative, astronomers didn't actually accept Chandrasekhar's result until about 1960. So the maximum mass a white dwarf can have is 40% bigger than the sun. That M with a little circle and dot means the mass of the sun. Typical mass, about 60% the mass of the sun. But these are the size of the Earth. They have a density of a ton per cubic centimeter. Now, Albert Einstein showed with his general theory of relativity that gravity affects light. Now, you know if you walk outside and you throw something up into the air, it slows down and it comes back because of the pull of gravity. Now, light can't do that. Light can only travel in a vacuum at the speed of light. And so when a photon, light, is traveling off the surface of this white dwarf with its incredibly strong gravity, the gravity of a white dwarf is 330,000 times the gravity here on the Earth. You couldn't go to a white dwarf in a spaceship and hover above it. You'd be squashed flat instantly. When a photon's climbing off the surface of a white dwarf, it has to climb against gravity. It loses energy, but it can't slow down. So what happens? Well, this is a little equation that shows you how energy of light is related to its wavelength. These two letters right here just represent a constant, Planck's constant, and the speed of light. Those numbers are fixed. And so when a photon's climbing off the surface of a white dwarf, it loses energy. And if the energy is getting smaller, then the wavelength in the denominator here is getting bigger. 
the wavelength, the light is shifted to the red. It's getting to be longer wavelength. We call that a gravitational redshift. And we can measure that, and that depends on the mass. And so there's another way we can determine the mass of a white dwarf, or in some cases, even a neutron star, which is coming next. Neutron stars were discovered by Jocelyn Bell, uh, now Jocelyn Bell Burnell, when she was a graduate student in Cambridge. In 1967, I was taking a undergraduate astrophysics class, and I came into class one day. There were only six of us in the class. And one of the other students said, did you hear? They discovered a star that's spinning almost once per second. And the rest of us laughed and said, that's ridiculous. You know, the sun takes 25 days to turn on its axis. And if it's spun in once per second, the surface would be going faster than the speed of light. It's impossible. Students said, no, it's been in the news. The star is spinning just a little bit over one second. And the professor came in and we asked him and he confirmed it. But the star was tiny, tiny, tiny. It was the discovery of neutron stars. Now, Jocelyn's supervisor, Tony Hewish, got the Nobel Prize the following year for understanding that these neutron stars, these pulsars she had discovered, were neutron stars. Notoriously, Jocelyn was not included in that prize, and it's quite clear she wasn't included because she's a female, because she was a student. Well, that was rectified in 2018. There's another prize that's just as prestigious as the Nobel Prize, even if the public doesn't hear about it as much. It's called the Breakthrough Prize. Breakthrough Prize is worth more monetarily than the Nobel Prize. It's $3 million. And the Breakthrough Foundation gave Jocelyn a special Breakthrough Prize in 2018 for the discovery of neutron stars. She is a professor at Oxford. Uh, she's illustrious and she's had just about every other award going. And she said, I don't need the money. And she donated it to the Institute of Physics to be used for bursaries for previously disadvantaged students, primarily in her mind, I think women, but not just restricted to women. So she simply gave the money away. Well, her discovery of neutron stars was revolutionary in terms of our understanding of things like exploding stars and supernovae. Here's a real picture of the Crab Nebula in Taurus. We now know that that is one of these supernovae where the core collapsed, it formed a neutron star and blew itself to bits. And that neutron star at the center of the Crab Nebula is spinning 30 times per second. An artist has put in these two beams coming out of it because the pulsars have got two jets coming off of them. Um, they beam light in, in opposite directions, and as they spin, those beams pass by us, and that's what makes them pulse. So there is a pulsar. It has a mass, sorry, it has a mass of about twice the mass of the sun, but it's only roughly 20 kilometers across. These two scientists, Joseph Taylor, professor at Princeton, and his graduate student, Russell Hulse, discovered a pair of pulsars, two of them orbiting about each other, and they found that they were orbiting faster and faster and faster. Their orbit was shrinking very rapidly. They were losing energy. They correctly deduced that the energy they were, they were losing was due to gravitational radiation, predicted by Einstein when he invented general relativity, but never observed. They too got the Nobel Prize in physics. In this case, Russell Hulse, the graduate student, was included in the prize, but then he wasn't a woman. And so the Nobel Prize Committee seemed like they were happy with the graduate student in this case. Neutron stars have a maximum mass only about three times the mass of a white dwarf, of, of the sun. They can get a little bit more massive than a white dwarf. There's a similar law to Chandra Sekar's limit for the white dwarfs. Size about 20 kilometers, and so for light to es anything to escape, it has to be going half the speed of light. Light trying to escape loses a lot of energy and gets shifted to the red. Their density is a phenomenal billion tons per cubic centimeter. Now, here's a little animation showing a binary pulsar like the two that were discovered by Taylor and Hulse, orbiting about each other and then the orbit shrinks and they get closer and closer together. And as they do, they radiate gravitational waves, which has been graphically put in here as these waves coming away. That's why Taylor and Hulse got the Nobel Prize. Of course, the orbiting of these two stars using Newton's form of Kepler's third law tells us what the masses are. In the case of this pair of um, white dwarfs, 
it is roughly about 1.4 times the solar mass. These were just a little bit too big to become white dwarfs. But there comes the gravitational radiation, and it has been a goal for more than half a century to directly detect the gravitational radiation of black holes and neutron stars orbiting about each other and then crashing into each other. And that was succeeded, that was, success came for that only seven, eight years ago, leading to another Nobel Prize. You'll see that knowing about masses in the universe leads to a lot of big prizes by two Caltech and one MIT scientist, um, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, and Reiner Weiss, for the discovery and the prediction and understanding the mathematics of gravitational radiation. So gravitational radiation is now observed, and that's giving us new insight into some of the biggest uh, collisions in the universe, crashing neutron stars and colliding black holes. The very first black hole that was proved to be, the discovery of that was in the constellation Cygnus, and it's called Cygnus X1 because it's an X-ray source. And here's an actual picture of part of the constellation of Cygnus in the Northern Hemisphere, and the star itself is fairly faint. Uh, you'd need a small telescope to see it. Uh, the discovery in Cygnus X1, or one of the astronomers who did that was Paul Merton, who was quite influential in my career um, from uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Cambridge. Anyhow, Cygnus X1, when it was discovered, was a giant star, one of these 30 times the mass of the sun, blue, hot, bright stars, orbiting about something, and that something was invisible. Yet, there were strong x-rays, and it, the model that was understood is that there's a black hole here, and mass from the giant star is falling towards the black hole, and it swirls in a disk around the black hole, spirals in, and just before it falls in, gets heated so much that two jets come shooting off, and as the material slams into the disk, it emits x-rays. And those x-rays do get eclipsed. It was easy to time the orbit, it's 5.6 days, and using Newton's form of Kepler's third law and knowing the mass of a star this massive from those eclipsing binaries I told you about earlier had to be about 20 solar masses, it was then deduced most recently that the mass of the black hole is 20 times the mass of the sun. Now, a white dwarf can't be bigger than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. A neutron star can't be bigger than three times the mass of the sun. This thing has 20 times the mass of the sun and it is invisible. And there is the proof that it has to be a black hole. The gravity is so strong that even light can't escape from it. Now let us look into the heart of the Milky Way. On the left is a picture of the Milky Way rising over the bush in Botswana, not too far north of where I am right now. Beautiful dark skies there where there are so many stars and it's so dark you can see your shadow by the light of the Milky Way on a dark night when there's no moon. On the right-hand side, there's a Hubble picture of an external galaxy, not ours, but this is like ours. It's a disk galaxy like the one we live in. Our sun is out here in the outer part of the disk, and when we look towards the center of the galaxy, we look towards the constellation Sagittarius. It's 30,000 light years into the center of the galaxy, and this dark band you see here is dust, which blocks our view. But if you use infrared light, you can see through the dust. And some astronomers started looking through that dust and mapping the motions of the stars in the center of the galaxy using infrared light. And they did that for a period of two decades. Here's an animation from the European Southern Observatory starting in the year 2000. Down bottom left, you'll see time going by and the computer graphic is mapping out the motion of the stars in the center of the galaxy. This gas cloud that you see is um, imagined by the person who did the computer graphics, but it is likely the way things happen. That gas cloud is passed around a black hole in the center of the galaxy. These stars are orbiting that black hole. You can see they're orbiting on ellipses. You see them move more slowly when they move away from the central mass, and then they speed up as they come closer to it, Kepler's second law. And then from Newton's form of Kepler's third law, you can deduce, deduce the mass of that object in the middle of the galaxy. 
Andrea Goetz at UCLA, Reinhard Ginzel got the Nobel Prize for that in 2020. They correctly deduced that that thing in the center of our galaxy is called Sagittarius A star. Using Newton's form of Kepler's third law, again, with the motion of the stars in the center of the galaxy, there is a four million solar mass black hole in the center of our galaxy. How did it get there? What happened? Very probably some supernova blew up. A 10 solar mass or a 20 solar mass black hole formed like in Cygnus X1. And then stars passed too close and the gravity of the black hole caused tides that tore the star apart. That gas then swirled into the black hole as you saw in the graphic. And for a black hole, the more it eats, the bigger it gets, the bigger it gets, the more it can eat until the black hole in the center of the galaxy gobbled up an awful lot of the stars that were down there and grew into this four million solar mass behemoth that is at the center of our galaxy. That's gigantic in mass, but not so big in size. That thing's only about 12 million uh, kilometers in radius. It's small compared to the solar system. On the other hand, if we look at a giant galaxy in the constellation Virgo, it's called Messier 87. That's the 87th object in the catalog of Charles Messier from the 1700s. He was looking for comets and he cataloged all sorts of fuzzy things in the sky that are great to look at with little telescopes. We can see from the motion of stars in the center of this one trillion star galaxy that there is a black hole in the center of that galaxy with 5.4 billion times the mass of our sun. It's several times bigger than the size of the solar system out to Neptune, but that's still tiny considering it's got 5 billion solar masses in it. Phenomenal giant massive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And here you can see a jet of gas coming out of the center of the galaxy. That is being shot out of the material orbiting about the black hole. Not out of the black hole, nothing can escape from a black hole, but out of the material orbiting it. Now, another breakthrough prize, remember these are equivalent to Nobel Prizes too, came in fundamental physics in 2020 for a group of 347 scientists. So they had to split the $3 million. Well, they got something like $8,000 each, but that's still not bad. They used radio telescopes all across the Earth to synthesize a single telescope with the diameter of the Earth, which gave it great resolution. And then through radio waves, they mapped out the material orbiting the black hole. Now, that was turned into a visible picture so we can see it. The black hole's actually down in this uh, black area in the middle, much smaller. You can't see the black hole itself because black holes are invisible. No light can get out. But here's the material orbiting about the black hole. If you like, this shaded part in the middle is considered to be the shadow of the black hole. And the same thing's been done for the black hole at the center of our galaxy, too. Here's an artist's impression of what it looks like around one of those giant black holes. Stars are torn apart. The gas swirls around the black hole and through viscosity, it spirals in. And as it falls in the gravitational field, it gains energy so much that it heats the gas to an incredibly high temperature. And before it falls in the black hole, just the pressure from the light, <coughs> excuse me, shoots out two great jets of gas in opposite directions. They come out at over 90% the speed of light. Magnetic fields guide them out into space. So here's an artist's impression. Here's the real thing. Here's one of these giant elliptical galaxies with a trillion stars in it. And in the center, there's a supermassive black hole. And here are the two jets of gas shooting out over nearly a million light years of space coming out from that giant black hole at the center of the galaxy. We know the masses of the giant black holes from Newton's form of Kepler's third law. Now, if we look out to the edges of the Milky Way, we get something called the rotation curve. All the stars in the Milky Way are orbiting about the center of the Milky Way, and they just don't make sense. And it's that not making sense that has led to the invention of the concept of dark matter. Here's an artist's concept of what our Milky Way looks like. The sun is here where I've just put my red dot, the laser pointer. There somewhere just below the middle if you're not seeing the laser pointer. There's the heart of the Milky Way above it. And all of the stars orbit about the center of the Milky Way and they obey Kepler's laws. 
But for Kepler's laws, the mass that matters, the mass that determines how fast they go is the mass interior to them. All the mass on the outside cancels out. So in our own solar system, all the mass is in the sun, almost all. And so the farther the planets are from the sun, the more slowly they move. Very easy to get from Kepler's laws. For the stars orbiting about the galaxy as they go out, when they get near the outside, they should go more and more slowly, just like the planets in the solar system orbit more and more slowly the farther they are from the center. Well, here's another galaxy, the great galaxy in Andromeda. And here's a plot of its so-called rotation curve. This is how fast the stars are moving along the y-axis. And along the bottom axis, the x-axis, how far they are from the center of the galaxy. If the stars were obeying Kepler's laws, then this curve would be the red curve that you see. Once we get beyond the light that you can see in the galaxy, where it looks like it stops, any stars left out there, and there are still some we pick up with our telescopes, they should go more and more and more slowly the farther they are, they are from the center. They don't. They continue orbiting just as fast as the ones farther in. That led to what was called the missing mass problem when I was a student 60 years ago, and is now called dark matter. In order for these stars to be orbiting so fast out here, there has to be other stuff there, but we can't see it. And so it's called dark matter. The dark matter is what keeps the galaxy together and keeps the stars orbiting at their high speeds. And so there we've measured the mass of the galaxy using Newton's form of Kepler's third law and deduced that in fact, almost all of the galaxy is some stuff we don't even know what it is. It's dark, but it affects gravity, dark matter. Now here's a picture of a cluster of galaxies. Of all the things you look at tonight, well, maybe not all, but probably this one. This should boggle your mind the most. This is a small patch of the sky. <clears throat> we are looking about four billion light years away, so four billion years into the past. And each one of these bright elliptical shaped galaxies have got about a trillion stars. There's some spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. You can see them in here, a few hundred billion stars each. And there are thousands of galaxies and they're all orbiting about each other. They're bound together, but there's not enough stuff there to hold them together from just what we can see. Dark matter is needed to hold the cluster together. Otherwise it would have dispersed over the 13 billion years of the life of the universe. And even more interestingly, look carefully, up here to the upper right, you can see a blue arc. Down to the left, you can see a white arc. Look around and you'll see arcs about the center of this cluster of galaxy. Those are galaxies much further away. And as the light passes through this cluster, the gravity of the cluster is warping the light via Einstein's general theory of relativity. And that's distorting the shape of the galaxies that are more than four billion light years away. For them to be distorted like this, Using general relativity, we can calculate how much mass should be here, and it's vastly more than the mass you see. Dark matter is needed to explain why the cluster stays together and how it bends the light to form these distorted galaxies from the ones further away, gravitational lensing. Now, I want to go on to the Big Bang, because this dark matter, taking you back to this picture, this dark matter that's there you might be thinking, oh yeah, well, there's just lots of black holes around. You can't see them. Or maybe there's an incredible number of planets which you wouldn't see, they're not very bright. But the dark matter can't be things like stars and planets. It can't be things like you and me. The matter we're made out of, atomic nuclei, atoms, molecules, we call that baryonic matter. And the dark matter cannot be that. And here's the reason why. We can see from the expansion of the universe that 13.65 billion years ago, everything was together. At that time, the temperature would have been so hot that there was only energy, radiation, light. But as the universe expanded and cooled, the light could be turned into particles. E equals mc squared, energy and matter are equivalent. The particles that formed were protons and neutrons. They fused to form deuterium, heavy hydrogen. They fused to form light helium, helium-3, they fused to form heavy helium, helium-4, and they fused to form a little bit of lithium before the universe cooled too much for any more fusion to happen in the Big Bang. 
These bars that you see are the amount of helium there is compared to hydrogen, the amount of helium-3, lighter helium, light hydrogen, uh, heavy hydrogen, deuterium, and a little bit of lithium. This vertical bar is how much stuff there is in the universe given the things we can see, the stars, and the galaxies. And these match very nicely. And so the amount of baryonic matter in the universe that form protons and neutrons and then could form atoms and molecules and you and me matches beautifully with what we see, the abundances of the oldest stars that formed right after the Big Bang. But that isn't enough stuff to hold the galaxies together. That isn't enough stuff to hold the clusters of galaxies together. And so the dark matter that's holding everything to together can't be the same stuff as us. It's a mystery what it is. We only see it via the gravitational effect on the orbits of stars, on the orbits of galaxies, on the expansion of the universe. <clears throat> now, this plot right here shows how far away, something called the redshift, how far away we're looking back into time. On the right hand, so left-hand side is now, and then we're looking back into the past towards the right. And on the left, we're measuring how bright galaxies are. Um, this is an upside down scale astronomers use, so the top is fainter and fainter. So the farther away you look, the faster things are moving, the fainter they are. This measures the expansion rate of the universe. And remarkably, only a little over a decade ago, some astronomers discovered that the universe was not expanding at a constant rate, it actually was speeding up. Now we thought, because there's mass in the universe, it should slow down prior to their discovery, this plot. They discovered that instead of slowing down with time, the universe is actually accelerating. Another Nobel Prize came out of that. There's Adam Rees, Brian Schmidt, and Saul Perlmutter from the Space Telescope Institute, Australian National University, University of California at Berkeley. They got the Nobel Prize 2011 for the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. And that then led to the concept of dark energy. Energy is needed. Energy and mass are equivalent. And so in the universe, most of the mass energy is in this dark energy, which is causing the universe to accelerate. That's led to our best model of the universe. It's called the lambda cold dark matter model. That lambda is a Greek letter. It has to do with this acceleration of the universe. The cold dark matter is there. And in the, our model of the universe, the amount of stuff that's made out of, that makes up stars and you and me only makes up 5% of the universe. The dark matter is another 26%, and then the vast majority is dark energy. And in our model, it adds up to exactly one. There's a bit of round off here. So the universe, if we've got our model right, we live in an infinite universe. We can see an infinitesimal piece of this infinite thing. And of that infinitesimal piece, we understand what 5% of it is. And from understanding 5% of an infinitesimal piece of an infinite thing, we have correctly deduced the right model for the entire universe. Maybe. You need to hold a little bit of skepticism about that because there are problems. We don't know what this dark matter is. We haven't been able to detect it other than we need it for gravity. We don't know what this dark energy is. We haven't been able to detect it except for this accelerating expansion. And so some astronomers have been working on other ideas. Well, let's look at what happens to the universe after it formed, because the James Webb Space Telescope is now observing this. Here's a plot of the local part of the universe on a very large scale with the sun way down in the middle. We're down in the middle of this thing. And these are now clusters of galaxies. And you'll notice that the clusters themselves cluster, and they tend to lie along walls. They lie along surfaces, and there are great voids between them. So when the universe formed 13.6 billion years ago and the first stars and galaxies formed, gravity caused them to pull themselves together into these walls with gaps between them. In our models, we can't make this happen unless we've got dark matter. We need that in order for the models to do the same thing we can see the universe doing. So there's another need for the dark matter. This is a map of a computer simulation of what a very a piece of the universe looks like, um, mapping out what happens with matter, dark matter, and dark energy after the Big Bang, and just letting the models run. 
In this particular diagram you're looking at here, every single little tiny dot of light that made up this plot is a cluster of galaxies. Not a galaxy, but a cluster. Thousands of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars make up each of the little dots. And this cosmic web is in fact what we observe for the universe. This is observed. How did it come to be? At the moment we use dark matter and dark energy, but all of this assumes the law of gravity, general relativity, or the simpler version of it, Newtonian gravity is correct at all distances. We know it's correct to incredibly high precision on the scale of the solar system. Uh, one of our best ways of knowing that was by tracking the Voyager satellites, which I talked to you about a few Astro Chats ago. But what if this dependence of gravity on distance when you get far away isn't quite what it is here? Could there be a change in the law of gravity at great distance that would explain all of what we see in the universe without the need of dark matter or dark energy? This has been seriously looked at. Models have been proposed. None of them is satisfying. None of them works as yet. And so we stick with our model with the dark matter and the dark energy. But tonight at least you've learned how we know how much stuff is out there, even if I leave you with a great mystery of what it actually is. Let's stop with that and we'll take questions. Thank you very much, Don, for this uh, fascinating uh, uh, talk. Right. Um, I, I see, I see. Am I back? Yes, you're yes. back. Okay. And uh, okay. there are questions, oh. some of them uh, arrived. I went, I went on way too long, so let's have a little extra time. Yes, we'll have a bit of extra time. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so I see the questions uh, from Steve uh, DeVoe. When material is spiraling into a black hole, what causes the jets perpendicular to the plane of spiral? Right, Steve. The material orbiting about the black hole, when it falls in, it will orbit about the hole, and that will cause it to um, collapse into a disk. And this exact thing happens, for example, in Saturn, where something got torn apart into small particles, and as they orbit about Saturn, they, they settle into a disk. And the reason is, is that anything that's orbiting above the disk, when it comes down through the disk, runs into other material. And so a disk gets spun off. It's the same reason our galaxy is flat. And we have a disk-like galaxy. So a disk of material forms around the black hole. And then it spirals into the black hole as a disk. And of course, the, the light can't shoot the jet out through the disk because of the high, there's, there's material there. Anything it tries to shoot out through the disk gets stopped by the material. The only free direction is perpendicular to the disk. And so it's it's the direction left over where nothing's going to block the material from coming out. Thank you, Don. Uh, I see Steve uh, Devo comments the mind blowing that 95% of mass of the universe is stuff we don't know. Yes, it is mind blowing. I hope that keeps you awake tonight. <laughs> So, uh, there is a question from John Levenhall. Uh, can a black hole uh, get so big that it turns, so sort of turns on itself? And if so, what structure of such an entity? Um, John, I think the answer to that is no, if I've understood what you're asking. The black hole can simply grow bigger and bigger, but it doesn't become more complex in terms of what it is. It's, uh, th we characterize it as having a radius, and that radius simply means the distance from the center at which light can't escape. The escape velocity is greater than the speed of light, and that's directly proportional to the mass. So if the black hole doubles in mass, it gets twice as big. If it gets 10 times the mass, it gets 10 times as big in terms of its size, but it doesn't change its shape. There's a theory which it says that a black hole has no hair, and what that means is that things fall into a black hole and it doesn't matter if it's you or me or hydrogen or helium or a planet or a sun, once it's inside, the only thing that we can tell about it is that it's mass. And so the black hole has mass, it also has spin. That it can be told, you can, that can be told because of the shape of the surface of it where light can escape, but nothing else. And so if the black hole were to be able to swallow everything in the galaxy, it would just be a bigger black hole. 
Thank you, Dom. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, uh, another question from John uh, who asks, uh, might the dark matter be some error in calculation of mass of black hole? Uh, if they heavier than calculated, would that explain missing mass problem? Has anyone investigated that? Okay, no, the missing mass problem is not particularly to do with black holes. It's to do with as simply as the way stars orbit about the center of the galaxy. But there's no mistaking the mass of the black hole because we see things orbiting about it. In the center of our galaxy, the stars orbit the black hole. And they go around on Keplerian orbits. And Newton's form of Kepler's third law is tremendously simple, and it gives the mass very directly, um, leaving no room for the mass to be anything else. So the masses of the black holes are calculated with good precision. Thank you. And uh, now there is a question from Ella Newman. Uh, does the mass energy equivalency affect the accuracy of how we measure mass in the universe, especially where objects are traveling fast, like in accretion disks? Oh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't actually confuse us. We know how to calculate that. Um, you are correct that if objects are traveling fast, they will have larger masses. That's the special theory of relativity. But that is, for a physicist like Andre sitting there, or one of our students, that's very easy to calculate. And the mass of the light in the universe has to be included in terms of the mass of the universe. And we can include the mass of the light, the mass of these very, very light subatomic particles, neutrinos. We include the mass of what we can see. Uh, we don't have any trouble um, measuring those masses and calculating them and including them in our models, except for the dominant dark matter and dark energy, which we don't know what they are. We just know how much is there. Um, <clears throat> now there is a question which is somewhat uh, um, outside of this talk. Still, it's uh, uh, interesting to know what you think. Uh, it's from Anna uh, Velikarodny. Why can't quantum mechanics be reconciled with general relativity? How close we are to a breakthrough? I don't know. Andre, do you know? No, it's a fascinating question, but I also don't know. <laughs> we, I, I know we, we're stuck on that, um, as we have been uh, right from the time general relativity and quantum mechanics were invented about 100 years ago. It <laughs> remains a very difficult problem. Yes. Uh, a question from Chris Ward. Dawn, what is your best guess for the missing mass? Uh, well, Chris, you've asked me what's my best guess as to what dark matter and dark energy are. And Chris, I don't have a guess. I don't know. Um... Well, Chris, you're asking me what are some of the things that are being proposed and there's a wild zoo of proposed particles for these things. Um, now, I can't answer that question. I don't, I don't know what the stuff is. Okay, there is a question from Don Matthews. So, will everything in the universe eventually end up in one immense black hole or something else? Okay, this was Don, was it? Like me. Don, Don. Yeah, Dan, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dan, if our model of the universe is right, um, precisely no. We think that the universe has, with the accelerated expansion, it will expand forever. And as it expands forever, it will become less and less and less dense. Things will become further and further apart. Eventually, all of the stars will burn out and the universe will go dark. And then all that will be left is photons, light, neutrinos, and some white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes. But for black holes, we know from Stephen Hawking that they will evaporate via the Hawking mechanism. And then there's considerable thought that protons themselves are not stable, and that over a lifetime, very long lifetime, the protons will decay, and they will end up also decaying into photons and neutrinos until the universe is made of nothing but photons, light, and neutrinos, and as it expands bigger and bigger and bigger, they get stretched to longer and longer wavelength, to lower and lower energy, until the universe just fizzles and goes away and isn't anymore. Incredibly unsatisfying. I'm, yes. I'm sorry, it's our best model. 
Your question would be if we had if there was enough mass in the universe to stop the expansion, maybe it could collapse again and have a big crunch and do it again. And almost everybody thinks that's philosophically much more satisfying. Unfortunately, the data don't point in that direction. Mm. Yes, quite sad, right? But <laughs> um, well, we're look we're looking at something like maybe ten to the thirty-two years before you need. Yeah, to we have a bit of time. We have a bit of time. <laughs> um, oh, there is an interesting question from T M. Uh, do stars that uh, gravitate around the center of our galaxy have solar systems? Oh, very good question. Um, in the center of the galaxy, the density of stars is much, much higher than here. Now, we know from the Kepler space mission and the test space mission that out here uh, in the part of the galaxy we live in, almost every star has got planets. It's normal. And so one might think that down in the center of the galaxies, stars might have formed planets too, but the stars actually pass close to each other. And it could be that planets get pulled out of star systems. And so sometimes the planets go free ranging and we're discovering free ranging planets out here in our part of the galaxy too that aren't attached to any stars. The other problem is the stars down in the center of the galaxy are very old stars and the oldest stars are mostly made of hydrogen and helium. The stuff that you make planets out, out of hadn't yet occurred in the universe. Those things got cooked up in stars that blew up as supernovae. So my guess is that the planets down in the center of the galaxy are much less frequent than out here in our part of the galaxy, but we do not yet have the ability to make observations to test that one way or the other. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, there is a question from somebody with Nick uh, uh, Dabob. Uh, how is the universe able to expand forever? Uh, like, uh, what is the driving force behind the expansion? If the universe is eventually going to fizz out, then wouldn't be the new expansion parts just be a void? Uh, yes, to the last bit, it will be a void. That's what it looks like. Uh, the expansion now is not only the, the acceleration of the expansion is driven by this dark energy. The initial acceleration of the universe, it, it got started in the Big Bang right at the very beginning. And so you've really asked me what started it. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that, but lots of people think they do know the answer. And if you really do need to, the answer, then please see a priest or a rabbi or an imam, they can tell you. But Andre and I cannot tell you what started it. But the acceleration, the, the expansion came right from the beginning and it's been expanding ever since. The dark energy is why the expansion is speeding up, but then I don't know what the dark energy is, so that may not be a very satisfactory answer. Yeah, there are still lots of unanswered questions uh, in the universe. Uh, there is a question from John Levenhall again. On one of your last slides, you showed this uh, very large scale of, of view of universe, which looks like a foam. Uh, is that supported by theory? Oh, that was theory, John. It's supported by observations. But the, look, the, the theory did not predict that. The theory was tuned in order to get it to match the observations. But I showed you a, a slide a couple before that that clusters of galaxies mapped that were lying along surfaces and with voids between them. That's actually observed. And so that purpley slide that I showed with all that foam was a model of the universe that included the mass that we can see, the dark matter, the dark energy, and it was let to expand from a condition like the beginning of the Big Bang, and it formed a foam that looks something like what we observe. But that purple slide, the, the, the opening slide with that purple background, that was theory. Thank you, thank you, Don. Um, there is a question from JPT. Uh, on the issue of alternative theories, uh, what your thought that Newton was right? Uh, could we be seeing all the mass? Well, sorry, JT, I'm not quite, I completely got the question. Newton was partially right. right. It, maybe it's related to this uh, one of our square. 
oh. which on the large distances, perhaps. Yeah, um, I put Newton's law of gravity there because to write down general relativity, the equations for, for most people who are watching this uh, look more difficult than even the law of gravity that I put in, the inverse square law. And so the Newton's law of gravity is extremely good. Uh, we need general relativity even for the motions in the solar system, but it's good. And if we imagine when you get to large distance, what if at great distance, gravity is now no longer falling off exactly as R squared? Lots of different possibilities have been tried. There's um, modified Newtonian dynamics as one of the major theories for that. People are still working on that. Um, there was a time 20 or 30 years ago when it was considered to be kind of almost crackpot. Now it's mainstream, but not very many people work with it as they try to see if there's some alternative to this idea of dark matter and dark energy. So far, no satisfactory theory has been found that we can look at and say, oh yes, that really works well, that explains things. But the work continues, people do work on that. Thank you, thank you, Don. Uh, there is uh, a question from Lucas uh, Margada. Uh, could the, uh, the big crunch theory be a plausible possibility to a less depressing end of the universe, the possibility of the rebirth? Lucas, the, um, the answer to that is that it would then need for the mass of the universe in that lambda cold dark matter um, slide that I showed you where everything added up to 0.9985 or whatever it was, where the model has exactly one. Um, if that number is not exactly one, if it's a little bit bigger, then we get the big crunch. And we can't measure that it's not exactly one. There's some uncertainty in that. But exactly one is what works for the model, that model that we're working with. And so the theoreticians actually like it to be exactly one. The op observers who can observe and try to measure what it is find it's very close to one. And many people would argue that that's a very surprising coincidence if it's not exactly one, because if it's not exactly one, it could be anything. Why is it so close? But if it were bigger than that, then we would get a crunch. And so you can hope for that if you like, if you'd like to have a big crunch. So we, we still uh, might have a bit more optimistic end of the universe. Uh, there is a question also, another question from Steve DeVoe. Uh, could the missing mass exist in dimensions that we are unable to observe? I don't know how to deal with that. We're observing the universe, and the universe is everything that can be observed, and now you're asking if the mass might be somewhere else that's not in the universe. And I think that doesn't work in terms of any model that's going to explain what we're seeing. There are models of multiverses, where there are lots of different universes. And there are some interesting things you can do with that in terms of thinking about scientific questions, but it's not real science, in my opinion, because you can't test it. Mm. Now, the universe, by de definition, is everything there is. And so if you want to speculate there's something outside the universe, that's not measurable. And as a scientist, there's nothing I can do with that. And so we tend to stay away from those sorts of ideas because we can't do anything useful with it in terms of testing it to see if it's right or wrong. Thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, I see another question uh, quite short from Helen Deemly. Um, uh, she's asking, could it be Kingons? Not quite sure. Is it close? Yes. Klingons like in Star Trek. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Can we blame it on the Klingons? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed Star Trek when I was a little boy. Uh, right. Um, I, I wanted to perhaps short question uh, from me on, uh, uh, as I'm fascinated by history as well of uh, discoveries. Why exactly it took so long then to the Sekar calculations been accepted by people? Like 30 years almost, right? Like 25 years for the astronomy. But, because Arthur Stanley Eddington's authority was so great that the astronomers said, well, if Eddington says this isn't true, then it's not true. And they just didn't deal with it. Whereas if you looked at Bohr, 
and Schrodinger and the physicists of that time, they looked at what Chandrasekhar did and said, yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense. Yes. The battle between Chandrasekhar and Eddington was unpleasant. And Chandrasekhar, by 1935, what is he, he's 25 years old, he was fed up with it. And so he wrote a textbook on the subject and he changed fields. And then he mastered another field and he wrote a textbook on that. And then he changed fields. And he did that over and over and over in his career. And every single time the book that he wrote was the definitive book on the subject. Uh, he was the editor for decades of the major astrophysical journal in the field of astronomy. And he was the only editor doing it all by himself. We publish more papers now, but there are now 40 editors doing the job that he did while he was doing all this other work. Some, is, some people are just phenomenal beyond everybody else. That is quite fascinating. Uh, I think we already extended our time. <clears throat> we did. I apologize to everybody. Um, I couldn't actually see my clock. I wasn't paying attention and I got <laughs> carried away telling you stories. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it was very fascinating. Uh, uh, we did manage to an answer uh, quite a few questions, uh, or you, Don, in fact, uh, answered. Uh, thank you, everyone who came. Uh, thank you, Don, for uh, being with us uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we will also appreciate uh, 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 feedback from listeners, uh, uh, which you will be able to leave in the comments to this uh, YouTube uh, video. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see each other in uh, a ready new year. All right, all the best, everybody, for the holidays. And see you in the new year. Bye. Bye.